sur des géants des mers avec un bateau qui fait 32 mètres de long, 23 mètres de large, avec un mât qui est à 38 mètres au-dessus de l'eau. Ça donne des proportions qui permettent d'aller très vite à la surface de l'eau. On a un bateau pour affronter tous les vents et toutes les mers du monde. On est vraiment sur des engins qui peuvent être allez, deux fois, trois fois plus vite que le vent. En équipage, on peut être à 100% du bateau tout le temps. La sensation exceptionnelle d'être entre l'eau et l'air. On est très heureux d'aller en Méditerranée. On a tous hâte de se retrouver pour le, vraiment le premier grand rendez-vous. C'est Nice avec tout ce que ça représente qui nous accueille. On va avoir un écran magnifique. Nice, par rapport à son histoire, elle a cette vraie légitimité de dire oui, on a envie d'événements où on partage. La notion de partage est essentielle. Avec Nice Ultimate, on va associer à la fois une régate de haut niveau et une parade qui va permettre à, à tout un chacun de toucher les bateaux. La Méditerranée, c'est toujours la surprise. Hein. On peut très bien avoir un mistral de fou et 40 nœuds de vent. Chacune de ces îles, chacun de ces endroits est un obstacle potentiel météorologique qui va rendre la course très complexe. C'est un vrai sprint, ça va être un temps. On a ouvert un terrain de jeu incroyable. Ça promet une belle bagarre. I'm Tucker Thompson, your host of the 54th Annual Congressional Cup presented by the Long Beach Yacht Club. Taylor Canfield and team were at the top of their game in the semi-finals, making quick work of Johnny Bernston three matches to none. And here comes Canfield. He's done it. We have our first finalist, and it is Taylor Canfield. Sam Gilmore pushed Dean Barker to a fourth match, but in the end, Barker moved on. Oh my goodness, big trouble for Sam Gilmore. The higher, the shackle at the top has let go. Folks, Dean Barker is your finalist and the Congressional Cup, an incredible effort. The finals were a heavyweight matchup between two-time Con Cup winner Dean Barker and three-time champ Taylor Canfield. Taylor Canfield owns the mark, he owns the finish, and as he bears away, he's gonna own the race as well. Match number one of the finals goes to Taylor Canfield. Wow. Dean Barker licking his wounds and probably angry and aggressive on port. Look for Team American Magic to come into this match all guns blazing. He doesn't want to foul Canfield behind, doesn't want to jive. Canfield looks to roll into a jive. Watch out for the fake, Dean. Watch out for the fake. It's a fake. He's gone back at Dean Barker now. Is Dean inside? Who's won it? They're crossing the line. They've crossed the line. Blue flag, Dean Barker has won it. An incredible finish. Woo! 
Canfield and Barker split the first two matches, but a wire-to-wire victory in match three put Canfield on the doorstep. Wow, Canfield again showing his dominance. Canfield 2-1 up over Dean Barker, bringing it to match point. The team started even in match four, but an aggressive tack by Barker put him down a penalty early. Oh, and Barker tacks back over onto Starbuck. Is he complete? Are we gonna see contact here? Oh, we're definitely gonna see a penalty. I don't even know if the trimmers are ready. That was the fastest tack Barker surprised us all. American Magic held the lead by inches with an incredible cross on leg three. Don't push it. Don't get another foul. Has he got it? Will he cross? Canfield will be looking for a penalty. Look at that cross, incredible. Holy moly, Dean Barker just pulled off one of the most impressive crosses I have ever seen. Barker failed to clear his penalty at the weather mark and opened the door for Canfield, who slammed it shut. So Barker shed his penalty and rolls into a spinnaker set, but Canfield is ahead as the boats head downwind. Oh my god, I think this could be a big mistake from Dean Barker. It doesn't look like Barker's going to wow. do it. And Taylor Canfield, folks, wins his fourth Congressional Cup oh, in incredible oh. fashion. Unbelievable! <laughs> we really appreciate all the support and uh, everyone that's been here for us the whole ride. It's, it's been a lot of fun and Long Beach Yacht Club, we can't thank you enough. We'll be back again next year. It was Canfield's fourth Con Cup victory in only five years. He joined sailing legends Rod Davis and Peter Holmberg as the only skippers to win four Crimson Blazers. The Vondi Globe is the Everest of ocean racing. You don't just wake up in the morning and decide you want to do the Vondi Globe. It has to be a, a, a lifetime of passion and commitment to get you to the start line. I've done over 300,000 uh, nautical miles and 31 transatlantics. I've raced around the world once, i cruised around the world once. I believe I'm getting to that point where I'm ready to do the Vondi Globe. As you can just see there's just a big cloud over here and normally when you are in front of the cloud it's actually it's pushing wind out of it and if you're on the back side of it there's very often is a vacuum so that's why I just said to Louis probably now you're gonna make a gain on, on the upside because it looks like I feel just on the other side of the cloud so uh, they're probably coming in the vacuum so we probably have a little stretch now uh, till the cloud gets over us we're getting light Axel gets again the new breeze then probably you get that effect again so it's uh, clouds is always an interesting thing and people say yeah can't you anticipate on it but it just all of a sudden appears and uh, not a lot of action that you can take so very often uh, the luck of the draw
Granny had the drone over the top of this container ship which has gone past, having a nice barbecue on top. And we've just gone past and we can smell the barbecue. We're very envious that we're eating freeze dried. It was probably made four years ago. They're having some nice steaks and beers up on the roof of the <laughs> container ship. So to explain this idea, we decided to start off super simple, super basic. This is the laser. 95% of sailors in the world started sailing on this boat. So basically, when you want to trim on for a because the sail is flapping or because you're going upwind, all you need to do, because the forces are small with small sails and with this nice purchase, all you need to do is just pull on by hand. But in a Volvo 65, you need a winch. When the loads get too big to pull by hand like I did on that laser, well, we're here on a cruising boat that's got winches and the, we're getting closer to the Volvo 65. Same idea applies, whack on the rope, Pop in a little uh, winch handle and then away you go. And you get a lot more force by using the winch. But these little chestnuts, as cute as they are, wouldn't hack it on a Volvo 65. For that, we need something a lot bigger. On a Volvo Ocean Racing boat, you're going to need something a little bit more substantial, something like this. This monster can pull on sheet loads of three to five tons and can generate massive line speeds that you need for doing a high speed jibe. Now, on leg four, Martin Kurizori, when he was sailing on board Dongfang Racing, put together an awesome uh, system preview about how all the system works. Check it out. Stay down. So that was a great demonstration showing uh, the power transferring from these pedestal handles directly into the sail. But it was kind of short, so if you blinked, you probably missed it. To give you a little bit more detail, basically this is a, a pedestal winch and you've got these two opposing handles. Now inside you've got a chain belt that goes down here and then connects to this drive shaft. And then your drive shaft goes inside the boat, has a right angle and then comes up into the base of this winch. And so every time that I spin the handles here, you can see that the rope is starting to get pulled as we go. So this on is, uh, is kind of the main sheet system here. You've got typically uh, one pedestal that can either be dedicated to the main sheet or can be connected up with the other pedestals. So you can get six people winding these winches with all of their combined power. And then much like the gearbox in your car, uh, there's a gearbox in these winches here. So you've got a slow speed for um, getting maximum force multiplication from here to there. So that's when you're pulling in a really big load or doing that final trim. Here is kind of middle of the road, when you're cruising on the motorway kind of style, uh, when, when you've got a decent amount of load, but still a lot of rope to pull in. But then you've got this sort of top turbo speed. Now this is when you pull out to overtake. Anyway, you get the idea. But, um, and so you're using those top speeds for the first part of a jive when you've got a lot of rope to move, but not so much load on the sheet. So I hope that all of that together has explained the idea of why you need uh, to multiply the force because the, uh, we, we're just not strong enough to sail a Volvo 65 just by pulling on strings with our hands and then the way that this all works on board these boats. Antigua's 51st sailing week opened today with a sparkling race in a fresh Caribbean breeze. Here's a look at what the racing fleet got up to on the rough Atlantic waters of today's Windward course. With over 1,000 sailors crewing boats from 37 countries, the post-race talk on the docks was coloured by many different accents from around the globe. Hi guys, Antigua number one. <laughs> the first day of the Antigua Sailing Week was very amazing for us. Sailing Week, beautiful. 
windy and wet today. It's just an awesome experience. It's good fun. Party was great last night. Some really good music. Amazing environment. You know, when can you sail with 20, 20 knots of wind, 20 degrees water? You know, great boats side by side, great hospitality. So we're really happy to be here. We're just looking forward to the next five days. You know, it's cracking. So the week is off to a sublime start after day one. Let's see what the next five days have in store. Well, it's that time of year again. We're in North Sales in the Sydney Loft and visiting is uh, Paul Westlake, who is Vice President of uh, North Sales and we're looking forward to another chat with him because he knows everything that's going on in the sailing industry. And the last time we talked, we talked about the Von Day Globe. That's where we left off, Paul. So uh, let's start there and let's go through what's been going on for the last six months. So welcome to Sydney and, uh, and tell us all about the Von Day. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, time, uh, time flies. Boy, it doesn't seem, uh, doesn't seem that long ago that, uh, you know, we were watching Amal and, um, and Alex just, um, you know, going head to toe, head to toe the whole way around the world. You know, the whole uh, question over foiling, you know, Alex absolutely uh, showed the world that you can push performance to another level. Amal, you know, we, we joked at the time when we last spoke halfway through the race that I, I think I made the call that it was a bit of a, uh, you know, a, 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 a cat and a dog kind of uh, deal where, you know, one was chasing the other and they had different strategies. But at the end of the day, fantastic race. Amal, uh, you know, showed uh, that he is a true champion. And it set, um, it set the base really for 2020 for the next event really well because there's a new breed of young uh, adventure sailors who are getting programs together at our current count i think there's uh, four confirmed new boats for 2020 i know a 50 is kind of on the drawing board just uh, waiting some final sponsorship and uh, jeff i have to you know good news for you and i is we don't have to do the event um, and uh, good news is that the average age, these guys are all under 30. They're their mid-20s. They've That's come right. through Figaro and um, they're getting sponsorship and thanks to some fantastic support. Is that France? Are they all French? Uh, not all French, obviously. Alex isn't, isn't French, oh, but no. uh, if the France is still the breeding ground. It's, it's absolutely the breeding ground, but there's a, uh, there's a new Japanese uh, guy who seems to be getting some funding together. So, I mean, it's a, it's a broad spectrum, but the, you know, the French is the breeding ground and uh, that Figaro class um, and the Mini uh, class really gives them the uh, gives them the skills to be able to go and uh, take on these uh, 60 footers. Well, we're both uh, one day freaks of all, of all kinds. For sure. Because of the fact that we just love it, yeah, because it's the hardest sporting event in the world. But it, uh, when's it going to bring somebody out from Australia? Oh, well, that's always, uh, that's always a, a good question, you know, Jeff. I, I think when we look at, uh, you know, just leading off from uh, Vondi into Australia, just generally, I mean, it is just powering down here at the moment. It's, it's fantastic to see what's going on. You know, we talk about the great, great, great race every year. Sorry, you know, that's a focal point of um, Australian offshore sailing. Uh, once again, this year, easy 400 footers, probably 500 footers. Um, I know the, uh, you know, the four that we work very closely with, which is Wild Oats, Comanche, Infotrack and uh, Blackjack, I mean, uh, those four boats are full on into development right now. As we're talking, phones are ringing. Um, we're doing studies for them. They want to go faster and faster. And, um, and I expect to see uh, Witty and the Scallywag coming back down too, which will be awesome. So 500 footers, Matty Allen's new 52. What a boat, I mean, the itchy barn. Four from four, uh, Matt is, you know, that's impressive. That, yeah. that must give uh, reason for other owners to, respect the fact that uh, if you put a good program together, you don't need to go and, you know, race the America's Cup to put a good program together with solid equipment, with good people, with a blend of friends and professionals, get the right advice, and boom, you win, you win the Hobart race, you win the IRC national championships, you know, you win Geelong. I mean, he, you know, it's just, uh, it's impressive what he's gonna do with that boat. 
And then on the other side, you've got a, a gentleman like Marcus Blackmore. I mean, you know, Marcus and uh, you know has been a great competitor over the years with all these hooligans. He went a slightly different route, and he uh, chose to buy the uh, top super series boat, Azura, which was launched in 2015. So, and he's bringing that down, and we're racing that this weekend in uh, Port Stephens. So. A lot of activity going on here at the top end of town, but also, you know, McConaughey 38s, I mean, the club racing scene, Adams 10s, uh, Etchell Fleet, the Etchell Worlds in uh, Brisbane this year. Etchells are just going crazy. I've been doing a bunch of Etchell sailing. We've been doing a lot of product development, you know, kind of testing, rig testing. Sure. I mean, everyone's pushing hard. Australia is a great place to be at the moment. It's really cool. Well, that's good, mate. Well, it's good to see that the local, uh, the local area is going well. Now, what about the Northern Hemisphere? What about the Fast 40s? What's happening with them? Yeah, Fast 40s, man. Well, there's a, uh, there's a class that, uh, a little bit like, I guess you'd say, the McConaughey 38s are here in uh, Sydney. Um, you know, very, uh, very dominant kind of fleet, you know, 9, 10 boats. Fast 40s, I think they're up to boat 12 at the moment. They just had their Easter regatta. I think they only got like five races in or four races. The weather was pretty uh, ordinary, unfortunately. <laughs> it always is. I've been that many times. <laughs> yeah, I think the Easter regatta, if you're in the UK in the Solent, it's a little tough time to uh, go racing.